Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the first in our four part series, Advancing Inclusion and Belonging in Health Sciences Education, hosted by Creighton School of Medicine, Office of Diversity, Inclusion and Belonging. I'm Dr. Jessica Seaman, Assistant Dean for Faculty Development in Creighton School of Medicine. Just a few housekeeping items before Dr. Ron Johnson will introduce our speakers. This session is being recorded and you will have access to the recording and slide presentation for future reference. We invite you to submit any questions in the chat and we'll get to as many as we can by the end of the session. We do ask that you remain muted with video off unless asking a live question to assist with the recording. <clears throat> Also, this session is eligible for CE credit and you'll receive the website and activity code before we conclude. There is a short survey associated with the continuing education and we thank you in advance for providing feedback as we continue to build robust programming for our faculty and staff here at Creighton. Now, I'll turn the time over to Dr. Ron Johnson, Senior Associate Dean for Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging to introduce our presenters. Ron? Ron, we can't hear you. Can you unmute? I'm sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yep. Great. Thank you. Thank you for your attendance at this Grand Rounds. We also want to thank Dr. Jessica Seaman and our two amazing presenters who I will introduce in just a moment. Uh, the Office of Diversity, uh, Inclusion and Belonging is committed to advancing inclusion and a sense of belonging experiences within the School of Medicine. And in this case, we're keenly aware of, of and we're quite sensitive to academic, medical, cultural climate issues that are reported by our historically marginalized groups here. Uh, and they have consistently told us over time that they do not feel heard, included, in the ex or experience a sense of belonging. So when it comes to diversity related issues, the Office of Diversity, Inclusion and Belonging is committed to making inclusion and belonging visible in the School of Medicine. As Dr. Seaman said earlier, this is part of a, a series of four uh, sessions that we will have designed around the topics of advancing inclusion and a sense of belonging. This first presentation in this series today is titled Words Matter Inclusivity and Power of Language in Building a Healing Environment by Drs. Amy McGee and Leslie Kunell. Um, we want really to make a clearing call that prompts us to raise the important question, what have you done to make inclusion and belonging visible in the School of Medicine? We are proactively working to facilitate inclusion and a sense of belonging within the School of Medicine. We want to make it tangible, visible, and sustain it through diversity, equity, inclusion, and a sense of belonging work that's done here at a Jesuit medical school, because these are important um, diversity-related experiences that strengthen the cross-cultural fiber of our academic uh, medical climate. So consistent with this effort, uh, we've offered this, this session today uh, by Drs. Amy Magea and Leslie Kunell. Our format includes a presentation that will be followed by a question and answer period. Again, we want to welcome our two highly qualified presenters, and I will try to provide a brief overview of their bio. Our Dr. Cunell is a Division Vice President of Theology and Ethics for CHI Health, and she provides leadership in healthcare ethics initiatives and facilitates ethics, behavioral health, uh, and critical access care committees. She also serves as the primary ethics consultant for Nebraska Southwest Iowa, Northwest Minnesota, uh, North Dakota region, con conducts ethics education programs for healthcare professionals and the community. She completed her doctorate in bioethics with a concentration in Catholic bioethics and clinical ethics at, at Loyola University in Chicago. She has a master's degree in healthcare ethics from Creighton and an MPA from the University of Nebraska Omaha. Her under undergraduate degree was in psychology from UNL. Uh, Dr. Kunell teaches bioethics and served as the academic institutions, including Creighton and Doan Universities, and she's a member of the Creighton University uh, IRB. Dr. Amy McGeha is the uh, Dr. R Roland L. Kleeberger's endowed chair and a family medicine professor at Creighton School of Medicine. She joined Creighton in 2011 
and has served as a residency program director. Her clinical and academic work focuses on achieving the quadruple aim in healthcare, especially working with refugee URIM and persons with limited access to care to address social determinants of health through a high quality patient centered, well coordinated team based care. She was named the director of Creighton's Interprofessional Clinical Learning Environment, or CYPER, in 2019. Before she came to the Creighton team, Dr. McGahill uh, served as the assistant director in um, the Division of Medical Education for the American Academy of Family Physicians. Her work with AAFP focused on medical student interests, workforce development, student resident scholarship development. She also founded a college scholarship program for uh, individuals from her hometown. Uh, she completed her medical school at University of Missouri, Columbia, and residency in Florida. Without any more delays, I'll turn it over to Dr. Cunell. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. And I will turn this actually over to Dr. Vivekanandan to go walk us through the uh, beginning parts of our program on what you'll expect today. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, Cassie Eno, she's going to be um, presenting some poll everywhere questions. If we can stop sharing, Leslie, if that's possible. And then Dr. McGeha and Dr. Kuna will present their content. All right. Hello, everyone. So this is um, a QR code that will work for the poll everywhere. Um, if you'd like to get that pulled up on your phone, I'll give people just uh, about 30 seconds here to to pull that up. There'll also be instructions on the next slide. If you just have a, if you have a computer and you don't want to use your phone, um, there'll be instructions on the next slide. So the first in this series of questions is going to ask you to respond um, in the past 12 months for each of the statements that you're going to see. How frequently have you heard, read, or used phrases? Uh, similar to the phrases you're going to see in the healthcare setting. So I'm going to go ahead and advance the slide to the first question, and then I'll give you, um, just so we move through this rapidly, I'll give you about 30 seconds to answer each one, and then I'll show the results. Cassie, this is Maureen Tierney. Does the she refer to a colleague, a student, or a patient? It could refer to any of them, just whether or not you've heard them within the healthcare setting. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and display results for our um, presenters and audience. So about Half of you are reporting, reporting this happening occasionally. So we'll move to the next slide. So next statement is don't be retarded, gay, an idiot, a gomer, any of these types of phrases. So I'll give you, again, maybe we'll do 20 seconds for this one now that everybody's logged on. And then I'll display responses. So the majority of people, so 60% saying they never heard, have never heard it, 40% occasionally, and just a few frequently is down there at the bottom. Okay, next statement is he's non-compliant. And again, about 20 seconds here. So 64% say frequently here, uh, another third at occasionally, and only 7% saying never. Next statement, a mid-level can handle this. And I'll give you another 20 seconds here. Mm -hmm. 
between the responses. Oh, about equally split between never and occasionally. 13% um, saying frequently. Okay, next statement. I can't understand foreign doctors, nurses, patients. Another 20 seconds. And I see 60% uh, occasionally and then equivalently split about 20% at never and frequently. Um, I did see a question in the chat about the QR code. I'm not going to flip back to that screen, but you can use the instructions at the top of the screen to join the poll. Um, next statement, she is refusing care. responses. 70% uh, occasionally, 25% frequently, and 5% never. He's a DNR. So a little bit more variability here, 22% at never, 42% at occasionally, 37% uh, at frequently. And then a few additional questions. Um, so not responding to the previous prompt. So these are just uh, a few additional perception questions. So I work in teams that use inclusive language to make all team members feel valued. Responses here, uh, split between occasionally and frequently, uh, 45 and 55%. Um, over the past two years, I am more aware how the words I choose may be perceived by my colleagues. Fifty-five percent agree. Forty-one percent, or sorry, fifty-five percent strongly agree. Forty-one percent agree. And then the final question: Over the past two years, I make efforts to choose different words when communicating with colleagues. I'll share the responses here. Again, 48% strongly agree, 43% agree, and 8% in the two disagree categories. So with that, I will stop sharing and turn it back over to your presenters. All right, is everyone seeing the screen of objectives? Yes, we are. All right, so um, Dr. V, do you want to share with us the objectives in the first few slides? And then we'll have uh, Dr. McGehee with her slides and then I will uh, present a little bit more information. Yeah, sure, thank you. Objectives is to recognize the impact of per person first language on the patient provider relationship, learn inclusive language and in professional roles within the team, 
discuss the power of language in building positive relationships. Next slide, please. When we discuss these issues, some of these discussion can be very difficult and uncomfortable. Complex feelings open emerge, guilty, anger, resentment, defensiveness. But we're all here to learn as a Creighton community and healthcare community. So this is a great learning opportunity and healing and growth opportunity. Next slide. And Dr. McGee. Thank you, uh, Dr. V. And I am so excited to be joining this group today and present. Um, again, I'm Amy McGehey. And um, I've gone already through an emotional journey of seeing the number of participants going up and up and up and feeling very nervous. Um, but this poll was actually very, made me, um, I'm in a very happy place now because what I'm seeing is that most of us are, are really kind of where I feel like I am. Over the last two years, I am even more conscious of where I am, of, of how important it is, of how I choose my words. And I'm making more of an effort to choose my words more carefully. So I hope that that's really the conversation that we can have today is that we're more aware of how important our words are and that we're making more of an effort to choose our words today. So um, I think that Leslie and I will hopefully give you some, some great information to, to take with you. Um, starting with the wisdom, I am not the, the person with the theology background, that's Leslie, but um, I can rely on the wisdom from the book of Proverbs, and I want to recognize my wonderful colleague, Dr. Noreen Rafiq, who gave me some words from the Quran. Um, but uh, a good word is like a good tree whose root is firm and whose branches are in the sky, yielding its fruit in every season with the permission of its Lord. And death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So um, right now I'm in the middle of getting all of my great fruits and vegetables from the garden at the end of summer. So, so thinking about the words and, and the power of um, language and, and how it's the fruit of life. So next slide. So language is the defining element of any culture. And healthcare is a culture, and actually cultures within culture. And healthcare has its languages. And so as we're talking today, thinking about the power of words and how we can choose those words to shape what we're thinking and, and actually how the words themselves shape what, what conversations we're having. Um, next slide. I'm always fascinated when I, I love these li lists you'll see in BuzzFeed or different articles where it has the words that there's no English translation and especially when it's a word that's an emotion. So there's some emotion that doesn't have an English translation. And I think, you know, there's always that, that shouldn't frown, right? So you're driving down the road and this car speeds past you, zipping in and out of traffic. And then you get up ahead and you see that the, the police officer actually got that person and they got pulled over and they got a ticket. And you feel that joy of seeing the trouble of that person got, right? So there's the German word schadenfreude, right? So there's this idea that there are words sometimes for emotions that, uh, that, that sometimes we don't even have a word for emotions, but in other languages, you can have a word to express something that we don't necessarily even have a word for. So, so I've always been fascinated by this idea that I don't even have a word for an emotion, but there is a word out there that might express that. So just a few fun little words. Hige, I don't, I don't know if anybody speaks Danish, but um, at Christmas time, uh, enjoying food and drink and it's associated with coziness, that there is an actual word to describe that feeling. Um, next slide. A number of years ago, I read a book uh, that uh, was really interesting to me, and it, it described um, a group of people, um, the Kugu Yimikyur people, and they live in the far north area of Queensland, Australia. And this group of people, they don't have words to describe left and right. Um, Rather, the way they describe direction is north and south, that they use cardinal directions. And so I wouldn't say that Leslie is to my right, because then if I turn around, Leslie hasn't moved. Now Leslie might be behind me, but rather Leslie is to the north of me. And so if I turn, Leslie is still to the north of me, right? And so um, this is a group of people who rather than keeping their orientation based on sort of where I am, they're keeping their orientation based on the sort of spatial orientation of uh, the cardinal directions. And so guess what? 
this is a group of people who are exceptional navigators because like right now I'm sitting in my office, I would really have to think about which way is north, south, east, west. So the fact that they are consistently aware um, because of the language that they use, that is something that helps their concept of being exceptional navigators. Leslie? Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm actually doing some travel to our, uh, our, our ministries in the Minnesota area. And I will tell you, I am definitely not the best navigator instinctively with the compass. So I really appreciate this and I appreciate all the introductions. And I think one of the things that we've been talking about is we've been thinking about why words matter and coming from my um, perspective in terms of how we apply the principles of ethics and the concepts we have about creating relationships relationship. Um, I'm very, very interested in the way we use language and how language helps us relate to one another or perhaps becomes um, one of the barriers to our relating to one another. Words matter because it's the way the words are, the way that we tell our patients and our own stories, right? And language is such this powerful way of relating to one another. And you'll see in the next slide some of the things related um, to how language can and create that sense of inclusion and belonging at the same time can create quite the opposite. And we'll be focusing a little bit specifically around this idea of integrating a person first language habit, if you will, into the way that we tell our own and our patient stories and some initiatives that we're doing within CHI Health with this as well. And I want to thank Creighton for the um, invitation to all of our providers and ethics committee members and so many that are joining, um, in addition to Creighton faculty that are joining from our, our Common Spirit and our CHI uh, partners as well to engage in this conversation. And, you know, I think the, the thing that I think about when putting this together is that really the sense of how we perceive ourselves and others, um, how people perceive themselves based on the language that they hear about or the ways in which they are described, how we perceive ourselves in relationship to one another, and the importance of how the language we use really does uh, set the tone for what's going on, um, Im impacts and implies the stance that we take. And the words that we use really are important in terms of how we think and talk of and about and to others. And in particular, of and about and to our patients or those with whom we serve in my section. And then our colleagues in the piece that Amy will be talking about in just a little bit. Um, and I think this is especially true as we focus on this patient care setting because of this very thing that we mentioned earlier in the slides. There is a medical speak of our own healthcare culture. And I know for me, thinking about one of the ways I was trying to fit in when I first got into the world of healthcare ethics was to adopt the norms and the language I was hearing and to use those phrases that could help me better communicate quickly, but also assimilate to my colleagues in a new context in which I wasn't quite so familiar. Um, they're the shortcuts we've adopted to share information. We know by a simple phrase, instead of multiple paragraphs, what we mean when we say certain things. But we have to think about how does that imply or what stance do we mean and, and what different impacts does, does that have? We think now, especially in terms of language, in terms of the medical records, where we capture what happens and where we tell those stories over and over to each other within that medical record, for example. We recognize it's especially true because of the power differentials that exist between colleagues and providers, between um, uh, care team members of different disciplines, between uh, patients and their care teams. And then we also think about and, and want to pay attention to the where. Where do the conversations take place? and how the ways in which we use language in terms of talking with our patients or talking about patients in our break rooms or talking about patients, writing about patients as we use documentation, those sorts of uh, contexts make a difference in terms of the stories that we tell. So I want you to consider this case and I want you just to kind of, if you will, you can close your eyes and think about uh, your image of this patient as I read this description. This might be something you would see charted in a record. Um, this unfortunate 43-year-old homeless black sickle cell female presented to the ED. 
She is drug seeking, allegedly has severe pain, and is demanding IV pain medications. She is a bipolar and non-compliant with her psych meds. She is belligerent towards staff. She's a frequent flyer and is again refusing to leave until she gets her narcotics. All right. So the questions we have is, is, is just asking, do you have a picture in your mind of this particular patient? Do you know patients like this? And kind of similar to what we asked in our polling questions, have you seen, heard, or read words like this to describe our patients, the ways in which we communicate with each other? So when we think about this and we kind of move on to that, we want to think about how the stories that we tell in the medical settings are powerful in a sense, especially when in this case it would be around documentation, for example, or perhaps a description and a short rounding or handoff communication. These stories perpetuate from one person to another. People get pictures in their minds based on the words that we use. I may never have met the person, but if I'm giving that communication to my handoff coordination or reading that in the chart, I've already got an idea of the person's story, which may or may not be accurate, right? These kinds of words tap into our experience, our assumptions, our moral imagination, if you will, and they're influenced so much by our own bias, by stigma, by social norms, um, by stressors, um, all of the things that are involved, right? And the question is, are they really telling the real unique individual story of the person in front of us at this moment in time? And most importantly for us, when we think about our, our mission and our values or our, our, our Jesuit values that we try to bring forward or common spirit, um, do they demonstrate compassion, respect, curiosity, and kindness? right? So this idea of bringing in person-first language, which would mean reading something very different or sharing something a very different way than we just read and heard in that example, is not new. And it's an important thing to be thinking about, right? Person-first language is something that we've started to talk about, and you'll see in the next slide some uh, history of this. But what it really means is that uh, the terminology we use to promote human dignity by characterizing the person before the condition or the descriptor, right? We first see the person in front of us. And you'll see in this great article, I was astounded by this estimate, maybe it's low, maybe it's high, um, that health Healthcare professionals can have as many as 150,000 patient interactions during their career. That's 150,000 opportunities to tell the story and to hear the stories of another person. And that we want, as we know from the basis of this entire series, that we want that communication, not just with patients and providers, but with all of us in healthcare professions to be respectful, inclusive, and encourage equitable participation. And that we know, and this article points out that not using first person language is, is very um, impactful as well. It can lead to poor patient outcomes, cause mistrust and patient errors, decreased satisfaction, poor adherence to treatment, which I will always say I tripped over that quote for reasons that we're talking about, but that's the quote from here, um, wasted resources and increased healthcare costs. And you can see here, um, pulled from this article, the, the whole idea of this is uh, creating that inclusive culture of, of equity, inclusion, of trust, to do that as a way that not only um, demonstrates our values, but is also very much a part of um, ensuring safety and uh, making sure that the care we give is the best care that we can. Now we'll see this, it, it, the, the concept of person, person first language really came about in 19, early uh, mid 1970s around the disability rights world. And we started to see a lot of uh, conversation about people wanting to think about what their identity was. Um, in 1992, the American Psychological Association did a shift, for example, um, regarding uh, Down syndrome. Um, people with Down syndrome, instead of he's a Downs baby or she's a Downs person, that we started to say a person who has Down syndrome, right? So that kind of thing is an, an important one for me and, and, a fam, and my own family's experience um, with my niece. 
um, in 2009, uh, an effort in San Antonio, I believe, on a camp college campus started by students to say, we want to uh, campaign not to use the R word in a derogatory way and advocate for inclusion. They had their initiative was called spread the word to end the word um, of, of not using retarded in the uh, derogatory way that it might have been used before. And in 2010, federally, uh, that word was, was mo removed from all federal documents as a part of Rosa's law. Rosa's sister, when, when talking about this, it, it points it out very well. What you call people is how you treat them. What you call my sister is how you will treat her. If you believe she's retarded, it invites taunting and stigma. It invites bullying, and it also invites the slam doors of being treated with respect and dignity. And I think when we're talking in terms of the context and where we see and hear these words, it's so important to be thinking about this, not only when we're talking to somebody who is present, but also when we're talking about or with others in relationship to that person. Um, what we say behind closed doors matters as much as what it does when we say things in front of someone. So, the, the calculus, the new calculus, if you were, is this idea that increased focus on a person plus decreased focus on the disability or diagnosis does get you to that point of demonstrating more respect for the human person and to, uh, to lessen stigma and stigmatization as much as we can. I want to kind of uh, look at this again, um, uh, a number of things that we have this particular study started to say, okay, what do we see when we look at uh, support groups for disability? Um, we talk about and hear that it's important to use first person language, but this study pointed out that when reports around um, support groups were done by those living with a disability, they were much less likely to include um, uh, language and, and to, to not include the first person language than, um, uh, than, than when uh, uh, people who were not living with this disability were writing about them. So we, we know that we have this, uh, uh, tendency to perhaps talk about the importance of this, but not necessarily use it in our own practice. So we're thinking about this at Common Spirit Health and in CHI Health and the Midwest Division in particular. Um, fast forwarding to today, knowing we've got a lot of work to this, in May, the Common Spirit Health organization put forward a mental health awareness month toolkit. And included in that was a whole lot of information on suicide awareness and some different things that we're talking about. But there was this particular poster that I really grappled with or, or a grab on, grasp onto because of the com conversations and importance of this idea of language. And it was a sense that especially in this poster focuses in particular on the behavioral health setting um, of integrating that use of people first language. And I think it's really important. It does emphasize that what you say, um, not only in front of the patient, but also behind closed doors and with, co with coworkers um, does, does matter. And it does uh, make us uh, rethink things and it impacts the stories we tell. In summer of 2022, our ethics committee began discussions around this and expanded to be able to say there are a lot of words, not just in the behavioral health arena where we see this change from um, referring to somebody by their diagnosis, he's a schizophrenic or he's schizophrenic, changing that to he has schizophrenia. You'll remember in that, um, in that case study, she's a bipolar, changing that to say she lives with bipolar diagnosis. Those sorts of things become really important for us to think about. Um, we're having discussions now with key stakeholders to incorporate that in practice, to think about when we hear and see and read um, other than first per person, first language, how do we shape and shift that so that we can start to make an impact on the culture, um, the impact on that language that we use in a day-to-day -day basis to model this, to uh, uh, think about the stance and the tone that we set and to demonstrate our respect for a person and our compassion and our inclusion by incorporating people first language where we can. Um, I will tell you too, the awareness of language in all settings, even by having these discussions, I know for me, I've started to notice more and more and more all the time. And um, in so many different settings of how we can incorporate and think about the different kinds of language that we use and move towards this. Now I wanna do a little chat uh, function, a little chat 
uh, interaction with you. So if those of you who would be interested in participating, we are um, putting together sort of the, um, the examples of person first language and things we can exchange for those so that we can start to give people references, things of I, I, I want to I wanna do better, but how do I shift? What's a better way to say something? Um, what's a better way to interact with a person in terms of language and to demonstrate this respect? And so we have examples here. Um, frequent flyer is one of those words that I'd love to, or phrases I'd love to never have us use again. Uh, but we want to say, well, okay, what do we say before? Because when we say frequent flyer, I know exactly what this person means. So talking about it in much less of a, of a derogatory way or in a real practical way, a person we've seen before. Um, he's a DNR. Um, I've always wondered where the uh, pattern of referring to somebody as if they're only their code status order comes from. And so I, I know the teams will wonder when they hear me say something instead of he's a DNR to his code status is this or his resuscitation um, preferences are X, Y, and Z. And so kind of shifting even in that language, um, she's a bipolar to she has a bipolar diagnosis or she lives with bipolar, um, um, uh, lives with a bipolar diagnosis. And you can kind of see um, all the way down homeless patient to person currently experiencing housing. And when I just heard not too long ago in conversation, he's the baby daddy. <laughs> And talking instead to things that are much more respectful of this is the infant's father. Um, I'd love to see if we've got some things in the chat that are examples of times when you might either hear um, language that we could think of in a different way or examples of ways that you've maybe changed phrases into uh, person first language as well. And while you're putting some of those in, I will do a little caveat here. There is in our conversations an acknowledgement that some um, uh, groups do prefer identity first language. For example, in the autism community, there is a very much a uh, preference by a lot of people to say, I, I, I'm, uh, very comfortable with saying I'm autistic and that um, um, that is a, a very big part of my identity. We see similar things uh, expressed within the deaf and hard of hearing community as well. So it's kind of um, important. It's important for us to remember that there may be variations between communities and within communities, but these are just some ways to start us thinking. Um, Dr. Vivekanandan, are you seeing anything in the chats that you'd like to bring up as an example of some of the things? Uh -huh. Yeah, not yet, but I will keep an eye and I can bring it up at the end. Great. Um, at CHI, we're trying to build a kind of an ongoing list and we've engaged our ethics committee members and our key stakeholders to keep helping us develop things. We're hoping to build some great reference tools and even just engaging in the discussions within our teams has shown some great um, um, examples and some great awareness of, of being able to integrate more of a person first language into our conversations, our communications, and even into our documentation opportunities opportunities. So I want to reimagine this case that we had before. What if we were to read this in a documentation? Mary Smith presented to the ED today with complaints of severe pain. She's requesting IV pain medications to treat her pain and says that this treatment has helped her with similar symptoms associated with her diagnosis of sickle cell anemia. She notes she has experienced decreased pain levels in response to opioids delivered by IV, Dilaudid, IV in, the, in the past. Um, Mary currently rates her pain at a 10 and states the desire to feel good enough to move me through the day, excuse me. Um, that would be a pain level of four or five. Other reasons for her pain have been ruled out based on examination and pain management via IV was started. Mary says she's frustrated with her situation, which is complicated by not currently have secure and consistent housing. She lives primarily with friends or in a shelter. She also notes difficulty filling her prescriptions to treat both her sickle cell and her bipolar diagnoses. Referral to social work to assist with these area. Mary relates well with a few members of the staff, though she, she says she does not trust some as much because they only see me as a drug seeker. And it feels like they just want to get me out of the ED. We'll continue to offer support and build trust with Mary, assigning staff who work well with her when possible. Now, 
I know that the words that we see there are much, they're more, right? It takes longer, but it's an important piece because when we can show respect and demonstrate, this is first about Mary, this person in front of us, we start to see stories in a different way. And that's really where the important part of why our words matter. What is the story that we're telling with the language that we use? And with that, I'll turn this over to Dr. McGehe. Thank you, Leslie. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, how we communicate with each other uh, as team members. And um, slide. Uh, some of you may recognize this person. Uh, George Carlin was a uh, comedian. And one of the things that he would talk about was this idea of good words and bad words or dirty words. And we're going to talk a little bit later about um, this idea of some of the words that are sort of words that we should avoid um, in uh, communication with each other. But the quality of our thoughts and ideas can be are as good, only as good as the quality of our language as we're using with each other. So um, I, have, I have come to this conversation with Dr. Johnson and Dr. Vivekananda. Um, a lot of this I'm not, I don't have expertise in <laughs> inclusivity and language and teams in general. Um, but a lot, a lot of this has come from my uh, uh, experience from different um, opportunities I've had in service and conversations that have come to me. So I'm, I'm coming to you from the literature and the studies and research I've done based on some of the experiences that have come to me. So a lot of the conversations that I've had with people have to do with characteristics that are ascribed to different people on the team and how, um, how that conversation has come about. So if you look at sort of the different people you might think about you're encountering on the team and, and who is a difficult person or who is a competent person or who would you describe as strident or quiet? Um, so one of the studies uh, that I had looked at was, um, this actually came from the tech literature. So um, there was a, 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 they looked at the evaluations, the performance evaluations that were done of 248 performance reviews in tech companies. And these were done by both male and female managers. And so when they went back and they looked at how different employees were looked at, the word abrasive was used 17 times to describe 13 different women. Um, the word abrasive did not appear in the men's reviews and characteristics of personal characteristics were not included in the men's reviews, but it was included in the women's reviews. Um, men's reviews did include uh, critical feedback, such as, you know, uh, constructive feedback, such as you should have gone into more details into some of your projects. And the women, 89%, or excuse me, 87.9% uh, of the women received critical feedback. Um, it did have constructive feedback, but there was also personal feedback, such as watch your tone, or stop being so judgmental. And so just being aware of how this dynamic um, may exist is something that we can look at as we're looking at how we interact with each other um, and that this is a dynamic that can exist in any workplace. Um, one of the things that I am trying myself to be more aware of as we were talking about in the very beginning as you know, as we're thinking, more about how we're communicating in, in um, just in general and what we're more aware of is this idea of the angry black woman stereotype. And is this something that um, people around me are experiencing? And is this something that I could, uh, that I, that I should um, be aware of or, or how can I be aware of this? Or how can I look at how this might be um, an issue of intersectionality and, um, how can I make it language more inclusive in teams that I'm working? So I'm gonna go through a couple of different scenarios and we'll talk through each. So in the first scenario, um, I need to move this because I can't quite see here. Uh, you're looking at a credentialing report and a female obstetrics provider is up for review. And one of the peer reports, uh, the person who's providing uh, background information states about this uh, female obstetrics provider 
that she can be abrupt in high stress situations. Is this feedback fair? Now, of course, if we were in a big room together, I would be stopping here and pointing out and waiting for somebody to weigh in. Can't quite do that so quite so easily in the chat. Um, but uh, I, would, I would say, you know, maybe, maybe not. Um, or the other question is, is this appropriate? So one of the things that I thought about when I was um, talking about this case is abrupt is a personal characteristic, right? So that's a personal quality. So how could you think about what this might mean in terms of a credentialing fact and what you would want to be looking for in professionalism? So looking at a behavior or an action, something like this provider has below average patient satisfaction store scores, or this provider is consistently late for surgeries, which might mean that they're abrupt and hurrying in and out, or doesn't alert staff in advance of procedures for the equipment needed. So then they're you know, abrupt and in and out. Um, doesn't stay after deliveries to debrief, and so they're in and out. But simply saying abrupt is a per personal characteristic and in high stress situations. And so, um, and there's a lot of places in medicine where high stress can come in and certainly obstetrics is one of those places where things can be very stressful. And so the question that I would ask in terms of is this appropriate is do we ask this question of everyone? So if you're asking this question of all persons who are coming forward for credentialing, is this person abrupt in high stress situations? That would be the lens that we might want to look at this through. So next scenario. You return from vacation and the manager pulls you aside to express concern that while you were gone, one of your newest team members, a black female physician, had an interaction where the staff, where she was aggressive and got all up in their grill during your time away, you had not received any messages from the physician about an incident of concern. What is your next question for the manager? So for me, the first next question for the manager would be describe the behavior. So describing someone as aggressive is again, more of a characteristic but what was the actual behavior? What actually happened? Was something thrown? Was there yelling? What was the actual behavior that happened? The other thing that was interesting was that for this to have been an aggressive, you know, it sounds like quite a kerfuffle, for this to have been an aggressive situation and nothing was reported in the interim, then why was this perceived as aggressive and the physician certainly did, hadn't reported anything. So there seemed to be a disparity in the perception of what had actually happened. One person may have perceived this as aggressive or uh, as something that was very serious and one person just perceived this as maybe a misunderstanding. So describing the behavior. And the second question was, has similar behavior happened before with other people? And in asking that question, it actually had happened before. And the behavior had happened and it was a patient advocacy about um, some policies related to visitation and um, uh, patient visitation and guests in the hospital. And other providers who had advocated for the patients were seen as champions for the patients. And this person was perceived as aggressive. And so, the question then is, if you are aware of this idea that there is a perception and a, and a possibility that certain characteristics may be associated with exclusion of groups of, of people and we're wanting to create a more inclusive environment, is there an opportunity to say, there are certain words that we're not going to use unless we can demonstrate a specific fact. 
So we're not going to use the word aggression or aggressive unless these criteria have been met. And so that's a conversation that could potentially happen. Dr. Magiha, uh, there's some comments and Chaplain Crystal Williams said, my experience is that aggressive is often used when black women um, is not docile. It is also used to describe when a black woman gives feedback that is viewed as inaccurate or feedback that is not welcome. Yes, thank you so much for that. And that's, that's certainly, that's, I, I hope, hope that's the, definitely the communication here is this idea that, um, that, that it was perceived as aggressive, but certainly that's not the behavior that was exhibited. It was not aggressive. It was, I'm not happy about this. And other persons have not been happy about this policy. And they were seen as champions, um, but this person was not. So thank you so much for that. Excellent. Um, okay, so let's go to another, thank you, Dr. B. Um, next scenario, you, a physician, I've got to take a little drink, sorry. There's a couple more comments. Um, I'm not black, but I'm a woman. And my experience is that any firm behavior from a woman is considered aggressive. I would frown on using what she may feel is black language. I got all up in the grill, so. Uh, thank you so much. And that was also pointed out. <laughs> that, was, that was part of the conversation too. That was absolutely, um, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm aware that I'm presenting in a, <laughs> in a formal environment here. Um, but, but this, this was, there's a reason why I'm presenting this case. Um, this was a, this was a, this was very much a situation where, um, this was, this was red flagged that, that, that the conversation that we had was, these are words that will not be used in this environment. Um, aggressive is not to be used unless there's aggression. I mean, like, again, aggressive is a word that we use if we're calling security because, you know, somebody has, is aggressive in the clinic and we're calling security. So thank you. Yes, all up, all up in the grill. There's a reason that I included that language too, because that was, that was also a flag that it was the perception of the tone, not the actual behavior. So thank you for that. All right, I, I am aware of our time. Oh my gosh, we are so over. I apologize, I apologize. Um, okay, uh, you, a physician, are forwarded an email from a male physician colleague in another department. It was a message from a younger female in a leadership role, APRN in the clinic, um, who identified a serious patient safety concern um, and asked the colleague to be attentive to some specific clinic policies in the future. I have never before received such a vicious, angry email. This mid-level has no ability to critique the practice of a physician. As you read the email, you did not perceive any threat of disciplinary action or personal criticism of the physician. What do you do? Um, I don't know that there's necessary any specific action that's indicated here because this is more of a collegial interaction, but I would identify that this hopefully is something that we're all looking at going forward that when you see the characteristics um, of, of the person that's being raised rather than the, behave, than the actual behavior, that that should be um, a clue for you that this is a conversation about characteristics and not actually behavior. And so I'm gonna just kind of skip through because Dr. V, I see that we are getting short on the time. Um, so uh, training ourselves to recognize bias. I do see that I'm finding this myself more, the more that I look for it, the more my ears are hearing it. Um, I try to uh, have surround myself with diverse representation because other people hear things that I don't because they come from different backgrounds. Um, progress, not perfection. Um, and, and that also means that what was okay yesterday may not be okay in the future. Um, I put this in here. Uh, this is an article about uh, seven dirty words about interprofessional. Um, I don't necessarily agree with this entire article and I don't even agree with this list. I will never refer to my patients as 
participants. Um, but I think that this is a good article to think about how we um, communicate collectively. And um, so some of the words that might be perceived by our, um, our colleagues uh, in a different way. Um, something that's helped me a lot is oops and ouch. And I will tell you not long ago, I was in a meeting and in an effort to um, say some, some words that were affirming about our commitment to mission, I, I said something that was um, insulting to people who may not have a formal faith. And I, I, I said something insulting and I said, oops, and I used that. Um, I know that's the language that's been used um, in some of the other presentations is talking about offenders, bystanders, and targets. And I do think that the more um, I'm cognizant of the words that I'm using, the more I am recognizing the language that I'm using with the teams around me. Um, because the creation of that space um, where the healing can happen, it, it, the, the creation of the conversations that we have can create that space where the healing can happen. Um, the last thing that I want to say, I will, all of these will be in the slides here with, along with our, with our resources about the articles from where this came from. But the last thing I did want to say is that it's really all about um, not us and them. Um, on Monday, I was sort of pushing fall a little bit and I wore a goldenrod shirt and I had a woman come up to me from the clinic and she said, I, I hope you wear that shirt on Fridays because I know everybody will be wearing red. And it just spoke to me this idea that people are consistently sort of feeling like us and them. Um, and so really, how can we get to this idea that, that we are us? There's really us. It's not um, different members of the team. So the physicians against the APPs, against the nurses, against the, the different therapists or patients against the healthcare team. It's how do we create the, the language that keeps us together as a team, um, focusing on when there's conflict, focusing on the behavior and not the characteristics, um, being aware of how your language can reinforce the power gradient versus how your language can open up for conversation. So again, Dr. V, I'm sorry, I went over a little bit there. You're totally fine, Dr. McGeha. Thank you so much, Dr. McGeha, Dr. Kuno, for this wonderful presentation. There has been a lot of chat going on in the chat box as well, but we open it up to questions um, from anybody in the audience. And Dr. Johnson, would you like to make any comments? I can read some of the questions that I've been seeing through. Um, um, some of the comments are, um, Identity is very important to specific groups. For example, not all uh, do prefer to be described as a deaf person, while many others do not. They are, they are people with hearing loss, not hearing impaired. So a lot of comments regarding uh, what we have been talking about. Um, so as I'm going through, and there's a lot of good examples in the chat as well. Anybody would like to unmute and ask any questions to Dr. Mageha, Dr. Kuno? Dr. Johnson, are you able to make a few comments? I, I am. This is a wonderful, I'm sorry, I lost the feed there for a second, but this was a great presentation. I, I think that uh, the one takeaway message that I came from this is that there's an interpretation component associated with a lot of the things that you're talking about. And sometimes it's difficult to kind of have the kind of cultural wisdom necessary to sort of discern that the things that you use in terms of words, language can be offensive or something you should be alert to as you go about communicating either